Okay. All right. So, so yes, I will, I will be talking, talking about the policy of cultivated meat. And, and I know that that, that might not be a topic that many of you are familiar with in general. general. So, so I am going to start out with what cultivated meat is and how that fits into the landscape of food, food policy, and food security. And then when people hear cultivated meat, they probably think about technology, space age, or maybe even post space age technology. And that's really the only way that situations like this can happen. Sure, this is a promotional billboard, but it's effectively true. We now live in a world in which products exist that facilitate into a meal for a Muslim. And if you can walk you into a bar and get your rank a bacon sandwich, and it's just kind of weird on its face. And specifically with cultivated meat, we now live in a world in which cultivated beef is ruled as kosher. And this seems like something fundamentally new, but the truth is food has always been tech. If we think about the artificial selection that allows us to eat so many diverse brassicas from Brussels sprouts to broccoli to cauliflower to the almost unbiological growth of chickens that we now enjoy post the chicken of tomorrow contest as food science people you may be familiar with that if you aren't look it up it's insane but also stuff like the chili dog stuffed crust pizza which unfortunately was not a part of my childhood but things like that exist and it comes down to food technology cultivating it is part of that food technology but really it is not fundamentally different, even though its value proposition really is. And here is what I want to come down to, because whether we're talking about food technology or any other technology, we hit these periods where we have something incredibly disruptive, because we want to fundamentally change the way that people live or the way that people eat. And I'm really here to talk to you about the food equivalent of the motor car, the television, the changes, changes in the food system that Upton Sinclair's the jungle caused, and even the microwave. Because just like the fears around cultivated meat, when, when the microwave came out, people were afraid that it would be giving them cancer and it would be destroying the nutrient profile of foods. And we see how the cultural concerns can sometimes drive the policy behind these technologies. And so the question is, of course, where does cultivated meat fit in? So I'm going to be walking through kind of how cultivated meat fits in the landscape of our current and future food system, starting with the problems that cultivated meat and other alternative proteins aim to solve. Cultivated meat is just one of three pillars of alternative proteins, so I'll be digging into those a little bit with a specific focus on cultivated meat. Because I do think that a fundamental shared understanding is really important before we start talking about the policy, including why you can't go to a restaurant or a grocery store and pick up these products. A lot of this actually has been talked about already in the different contexts of the CHIPS Act and other policy initiatives. And so I hope you'll be able to see that, um, that joint narrative of cultivated meat and other science topics. And, and then, then I, I do want to kind of open this up, either just for thought or for discussion of, I'm going to talk about a lot of hurdles, regulatory hurdles, investment hurdles. And there is arguments to be made that, you know, these exist for a reason, to protect the consumer. And I want everybody to start thinking about, are we at a good balance at this point for cultivated meat? Now, the large overarching problem that, that cultivated meat and alternative proteins aim to solve is this big question of how are we going to feed an estimated 10 billion people by 2050? And, and of course, we don't, we don't just want to feed people while exploiting our environment, while exploiting the workers that provide us food. We want to feed people sustainably, efficiently, and safely. And the unfortunate truth is that our current food system doesn't really do that, that. Especially, especially when we consider industrial, industrial animal agriculture. I will dig into this a little bit more in a bit, but again, the unfortunate truth is that industrial animal agriculture 
is one of the most significant contributors to climate change. And that's not even considering the pollution of our air and waterways that is um, directly contributed from it. There's also just the sheer efficiency that just the process of growing an animal takes a lot more energy than the process of growing plants directly and safety. We know that the use of antibiotics in animal agriculture is incredibly high, driving antibiotic resistance. My grandmother-in-law is currently battling a antibiotic-resistant infection, and that's something that hits really close to home for me, and I'm sure it does for many of you as well. And what this means is that basically whatever you care about, alternative proteins actually can be a part of the solution. And when people talk about alternative proteins, alternatives to traditional animal agriculture, the conversation typically starts here with animal suffering. And that is absolutely true. An estimated 3 trillion animals per year are dedicated to human consumption. But we're not really going to talk about that because this is inherently a value judgment. And I know people will come down on opposite sides of the debate. The, the rest, rest of these concerns are really just numbers driven. And, and that's, that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this. Whether it be swine flu or avian flu or other zoonotic diseases, having so many animals in a concentrated space, we know are both um, opportunities for zoonotic disease transmission as well as that antibiotic resistance that we are talking about. So for our own biosecurity, transitioning away from such intensive animal agriculture is a really good idea. We also have the environmental devastation that I mentioned before in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, as well as land use and overall pollution, and global food insecurity. I'm sure many of you remember the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and there was a concern for meat supply as the meat packing plants and the industry was dealing with worker shortages and other supply chain disruptions. And yet with all of these things taken into consideration, we see global meat demand rising. Again, by 2050, it is only expected to continue to increase if we do not provide these alternative solutions. Now, the, the maybe standard argument and easy argument is, okay, let's just eat plants. Why am I here talking about alternative proteins as opposed to, hey, I've got this great lentil dish that you should try? Well, we've been trying that for a while, and it hasn't really worked. With the vegetarian and vegan movement growing in strength and popularity and visibility, for the past 60, 70 years, like I just showed you, global meat consumption is increasing. And there is only, frankly, a small percentage of the population who is interested in becoming a vegetarian or vegan with traditional plant-based products. The rest, of the, uh, the rest of the population who identify as either omnivores or flexitarians, they are interested in reducing their meat consumption but they still want that experience of eating meat. And then that's where we come in. I am a part of the Good Food Institute, which as Charlie mentioned, is a nonprofit think tank funded completely by philanthropy, who works to drive the production of a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply through alternative proteins. Now, I am speaking um, from the science and technology branch of GFI, but we also have significant um, work in corporate engagement, both at the startup and, frankly, international conglomerate level, as well as the reason why we are all here, the policy side, in which we advocate for fair labeling and um, private and public sector investment. Now, the really exciting thing about GFI is that we do have a global presence, and I'll speak more about that at the very end in terms of global presence I'm directly involved with. But, of course, being here, we have um, GFI US, but we have international affiliates in Brazil, Europe, Israel, India, 
the Asia Pacific region, and we do have strategic partners within China because we do believe that this is a this will require a global effort to really have this transition and help um, fight against all of those problems that I indicated previously. So, so really all does come down to this, because we see that the current development of, or the current production of meat, egg, and dairy is driving these worldwide and somewhat existential problems. And this leads to our solution. Knowing that we can create meat, eggs, and dairy more sustainably and efficiently when we make them from plants, produce them from fermentation, and the reason why I'm speaking to you here, specifically cultivating them directly from cells. Because like I said, we've been asking people to reduce or eliminate meat from their diet, and that's just not working. We don't want to, because we can't rely on asking people to give up the foods that they love. We are looking to transition away from industrial animal agriculture by changing the default option to alternative proteins that are as, if not more, delicious, affordable, and accessible. So I am happy, like I said, I will be available for the next couple of days. I'm happy to talk about these other issues offline after this, during lunch, during the happy hour, whatever. Um, I'm just going to focus on the environmental impacts just to kind of give a grounding for this. Now, part of what GFI does is um, I directly work with and partner with people who are conducting life cycle analyses of different alternative protein products. Here is one example in which we were partnering with CE Delft and they were investigating life cycle analysis of cultivated meat as compared to traditional meat products. And what you see here is, again, one of the reasons why cultivated meat is so important of an investment and a transition of the current market. So when we look at this, anywhere from 64 to 90% land use reduction of um, cultivated meat to traditional animal agriculture. And you see this basically in every other instance with greenhouse gas emissions roughly equivalent with chicken, but you, as food scientists, you probably are already aware that raising, um, raising cattle for beef is the most environmentally intensive um, product basically currently on the market. And that is a 92% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from cultivated meat to um, conventional beef. And what I want to point out here is all of these numbers was basically giving meat production every benefit of the doubt possible. These were ambitious benchmarks for 2050, which are better than the current metrics of the top fifth percentile of meat production. So basically giving conventional animal agriculture every leg up possible, these are still the improvements that we see if we are transitioning to um, cultivated meat. And a lot of this comes down to the inherent inefficiencies of just growing, uh, growing protein through an animal. We do see that chicken is the most, um, most efficient animal product, but again, it takes 34 calories of feed to produce one calorie of edible, um, edible animal product in a cow. That's a 3% conversion ratio, which leads to a lot of um, expanded land use, expanded water use, like I just showed in the previous slide. And then one kind of understandable argument would be, okay, so let's just make animal production more efficient. But like I mentioned um, at the beginning with the chicken of tomorrow contest, we've already done that. We've already cranked out the most efficient chicken possible, frankly, well beyond its natural limits. Right now, um, based on the numbers, at least that I have access to, we are hitting a six pound chicken in about six weeks. And that's kind of mind boggling, especially if you consider turning back the clock um, 100 years, you get about, you get a bird less than half of that size 
in about 16 weeks. So we have already increased efficiency basically to the breaking point, and then we've hit a ceiling with animal agriculture. And then this brings us to the three pillars of alternative proteins, plant-based, fermentation, and cultivate. So I'll walk through each one again just so we have a shared understanding. Now, plant-based meats are probably the ones that, that people are most familiar with. They, um, they work basically because, well, just like animal products, Plants are composed of all of the fundamental components of food, protein, fat, vitamins, minerals, water, all of that. And so you can replicate the taste and overall eating experience of conventional meat, sometimes with added benefits like complex carbs and fiber. The primary challenge of plant-based meats, as I'm sure you have experienced like in the earlier generations of Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger, are that Plant proteins, plant proteins tend to have a different protein structure thanks to its secondary and tertiary structures that it tends to be much more globular as opposed to the fibrillo proteins that are characteristic of animal, um, animal muscle cell tissue. And that is basically where the research and development is grounded for plant-based meats. We start with source selection and optimization. So this is crop development, then the processing of those ingredients to specific protein streams, starch streams, and other. And then how do you turn that into something that is appealing to the consumer? I will come back to this later, but even if you just look at this slide, here is an indication of how many different types of professionals and experts we need in this field, whether they be crop scientists, physicists to develop that, that protein, protein structure, structure, biologists, basically, basically everyone is invited and needed in this space. Now, now when it comes to fermentation, fermentation, often this is used as an enabling technology to improve the characteristics of other alternative protein products to create these functional ingredients. Typically, these will be through uh, the growth of microorganisms, anything from filamentous fungi to bacteria to yeast. Um, and depending on the end goal, sometimes you use that entire organism or a specific product that they are producing. So this is kind of broken down into subsections. There are traditional fermentation products. This is something that people would recognize from hundreds of thousands of years ago, you know, cultured yogurt, um, tempeh, that sort of thing. You also have biomass fermentation. If you're anything like me, this is a, one of the first alternative proteins um, that you experienced. Um, corn with the QU in the freezer section was a staple in my household growing up. Um, and it's just one of those old standbys. And the current generation of fermentation is really focused on precision fermentation. And this is when you can either engineer or select for microorganisms that produce a specific product. You see some examples of companies that use that strategy here. Um, anything from milk proteins, so you're essentially getting real milk without the cow. Um, companies like Perfect Day have been using this to the um, well-known Impossible Burger. They use precision fermentation to include that like hemoglobin, that, um, that characteristic of bloody consist uh, consistency, um, taste and eating experience that kind of sets them apart in the alternative protein field. One thing that I do want to say here is that precision fermentation is not specific to alternative proteins. If you or anyone you know takes insulin for diabetes, that was very likely um, created through precision fermentation, same with a lot of B vitamin supplements. So this is something that is already an existing technology, just being used in a different application. But now we come to the reason why I am technically here today to talk about cultivated meat. And this is a slightly um, unique pillar because it's not really a meat analog. It's just meat. Cultivated meat is it using cells, uh, muscle, fat cells, that would be the same as if you were eating um, meat from an animal, but essentially you can get a chicken breast without the chicken. That is the goal. There we go. So, so similarly, um, here you will see something very similar until um, the end product development to 
cell culture that you might be familiar with if you work in the biopharmaceutical industry or other um, scientific research disciplines. You start off by taking a biopsy from an animal. Very important point, that animal continues living. It's a biopsy that would be similar to if you needed any sort of you know medical screening. I have a liver biopsy. Like it's basically that small, um, something you could fit within, uh, within a syringe. And from there, the, that cell sample is immortalized to create a stable cell line. And those cells are then proliferated in a bioreactor, a biofermenter. And um, those, those cells are then matured on a scaffold in which they can be uh, differentiated into the different types of cells that you're looking for those muscle and fat cells. And, and what is really exciting, um, this was a survey of cultivated meat companies on what sorts of cells that they are working with. Yes, the vast majority of companies are working with those muscle cells, which kind of makes sense. That's the primary thing that we eat. Um, we also have fibroblasts and fat cells, but there are also those like helper cells that the companies are working with, which are indicating a business-to-business -to -business marketplace. And the exciting part about that is that that means this is a much more thriving um, a thriving market in which businesses can actually provide products to each other. So that's an indication that this is a growing, um, a growing sector. Now, the other really exciting thing about this, kind of like I said, is this turns meat into a renewable resource. Because anyone who has worked in cell culture knows if you have an immortalized cell line, you just keep coming back to it. And the animal you take it from doesn't go anywhere. And so you can continue and continue to grow more meat from the same raw material, um, which addresses so many of those issues that we were talking about with animal agriculture. And all of this has led to brand new foods. And the first step along this, the world's first cultivated burger, I want to highlight this. That was in 2013. That means that the field is effectively 10 years old, just at its beginning stages. And Yes, we have had much more um, development and diversity of products since then, which has been really exciting. Anything from a meatball to cultivated fish to a shrimp dumpling. That's really exciting. But when I point out that this is a 10-year-old field, I want everybody to think about that because depending on how keyed in you are to um, the, the journalism around this space, there's a lot of hype and a lot of fear about, oh, alternative proteins are crashing because of different market forces. And then this, this would be very, very similar to saying that electric vehicles are going to go nowhere in the turn of the millennium, or that solar is never going to be well established in the middle of the 1980s. We are just at the beginning, and we have yet to have that expansion of production capacity and investment, largely driven from policy, which I will get into shortly, that allows for that expansion and that market, uh, that market hold. But we have also seen opportunities expand in the cultivated meat sector. Um, in 2020, um, Prime, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel became the first head of state to try cultivated meat. Um, and later in that year, Singapore was the first and unfortunately still only country to, um, to allow cultivated meat for consumer consumption. Now, now, we, we might, might be close to that step in the U.S. because in 2022, Upside Foods was given the regulatory green light from the FDA for their cultivated meat product. That does not mean that it can now come to a store near you for reasons that I will get to shortly. But we have also seen more investment. Now, that is a relative term. But it has been more investment because in 2021, the USDA granted Tufts University $10 million to establish an, a National Institute for Cellular Agriculture. So when we think about all of these possibilities, these three pillars of alternative proteins, a common question that I get is, all right, so which one is it? 
which, which one is going to be the, the thing that, that takes over our food system in 10, 20, 30 years. And what we at GFI have seen, um, just kind of with the market in general, is that very likely not one pillar will dominate. And even within a given product, you'll probably see multiple pillars at play. With those fermentation products, as I indicated, those are often enabling technologies, but we are even starting to see hybrid products with cultivated um, and plant-based, as an example, um, pieces of the end product, and companies are starting to use this strategy already. One example being Mission Farms that uses cultivated animal fat, which I'm sure many of you know, drive a large part of the eating experience, not only with flavor, but with texture, alongside a... Um, plant protein base, which is all, all of which to say kind of the possibilities are endless, both in terms of the science and the creativity. But even though I work at GFI, this is when I kind of get a little salty. I haven't eaten cultivated meat yet. And it's kind of a bummer. Uh, that is not me. Uh, that is Elliot, um, our, one of our cultivated meat experts in Singapore. But that's kind of where you have to go, unless, unless you know somebody um, eating their cultivated chicken product, um, eat just cultivated chicken product. On their way, even more salty. This is some of the students that I work with. They, because they live in the right area, got to go on a factory tour of wild type and try their cultivated salmon. Um, yeah, yeah, that hasn't happened for me yet. <laughs> so so that, kind of, like, that begs the question, why can nobody eat it unless you go on a factory tour or can book a flight to Singapore? At which point, like, you actually have to sign a disclaimer or a, a release of liability because these are not products available for the consumer. They have not been regulated by the FDA yet. So here's where we come to the policy. We do have a number of hurdles that are in the way of cultivated meat being accessible to the general consumer. One is production, and which is highly keyed into investment and regulation. But this is a field that a lot of people are excited about, frankly. This is why um, the sector is, frankly, exploding at an almost an exponential rate. These are all startups that have started working in the cultivated meat field, but it's not just startups. Here are some of the biggest food companies, but not just food companies, the biggest animal product companies in the world who have specifically invested in cultivated products, including Tyson and Cargill. The reason I point this out is because I want to emphasize, and I will continue emphasizing, that alternative proteins and cultivated meat included aren't really niche anymore. And this is one thing that GFI prides itself in, is we are pro-alternative protein market. We are happy to work with anyone and everyone who shares our vision. With all this excitement, the capacity just isn't there. This again um, was one of the analyses that we took part in. And as I had said, the technology um, is effectively the same between biopharmaceutical, cell culture, and cultivated meat. And if you took the entire global capacity for cell culture as it currently stands, and you wanted to get to be 0.4%, of the meat market estimated in 2030, you need 22 times the current production capacity. That's, that's a big gap. We, we aren't really close there yet. So we need to build this capacity. Again, I want you to think about some of the other topics that I've brought up in terms of renewable energy, in terms of um, whether that be electric cars or solar capacity and then the scaling up that that required. So, so we know that R&D is a critical need. This, this is the first time I'm going to plug our website, gfi.org, because one of the um, 
one of the primary drivers of what we do is ensuring open access to research, strategy, and other information of anybody who wants to join in this space, whether that be scientific deep dives, we have a startup manual, um, we have basically explainers of relevant policy, almost anything you need will be at our website and open to anybody and everybody. But we do need R&D, whether that be for increasing efficiency of production, whether that be in designing of those large scale bio uh, manufacturing plants, or just replicating the eating experience of the end products. This is what we are driving for. And the excitement and the need and the gap is why investment continues to climb. And you'll see here, like I said, cultivated meat as a sector is basically 10 years old. Even if you look at, you know, just five years ago, the investment in cultivated meat is effectively nothing. And that is rapidly expanding. But it's not really matching the, the, the cost. The level of investment is not matching the cost. We see here global livestock emissions is roughly equivalent to those from transportation. But if we look at overall investment, electric transportation versus alternative proteins, well, there's not really any sort of equitable investment there, even though the climate impact is roughly equivalent. And if we zoom out to include energy, electricity, and transportation, we see that um, the, the climate impacts, again, are roughly equivalent. And even though the global market is only about twice the size for energy as agriculture, again, if we look at this, uh, the investments on a global scale, it barely is on the same scale. A few billion as opposed to multiple trillions. And I am not saying, please do not interpret this as me saying we should not be investing in renewable energy. I firmly believe I was brought into this field um, with a passion for environmental sustainability. All of that is worthwhile investment. I am saying that the investment in alternative proteins is just as important if we really do care about these end goals. And we know that government investment specifically is what spurs innovation and competitiveness. We heard about this with the CHIPS Act and the other um, national security, frankly, um, drivers behind why we are doing that. And just as was spoken about there, the US is kind of falling behind. So even if we look, sometimes I need to remind myself all of kind of the, the disclaimers here. This is just fiscal year 2017 for just US clean energy research and development as compared to all government investment in alternative proteins for all time. And you also see GFI, sadly, we're not really on the scale there either, but we are also a granting body for people doing research in alternative proteins, one of which is actually at Penn State, which is very exciting. We'll talk more about that later. But you see like the scale here really doesn't match up with the need that I have talked about. But if we, as the US, as the global community, are serious about meeting the goals that we state, we do need to drive investment in alternative proteins. As an example, we had a COP26 in which um, more than 100 countries pledged to cut methane emissions. Well, whether it be the perennially talked about cow burps, that drive methane emissions or the other products directly from animal agriculture. Agriculture is the uh, one of the largest sources of human caused methane emissions. And so we can't really meet that goal without transitioning away from animal agriculture. Similarly, at COP27, there was a pledge to end deforestation by 2030. But, but deforestation, deforestation is largely driven by a um, transition to cropland to feed animal agriculture. Now, now there, there is, is positive news here because, because 
even um, in the highest level, there have been um, demonstrations that alternative proteins are no longer niche. So as part of President Biden's executive order in September of last year, there was a specific call out to research and investment of alternative proteins, specifically to improve, as it says, food security, driving agricultural innovation, including through new technologies with food made with animal or cultured animal cells. So there is a recognition of this again, but basically we need to start spurring that and building that momentum. Now, now I talked about, about even with that FDA green light for upside foods, one company, it's, it's not, not available in restaurants or stores. And, and that's because specifically in the US, there is joint jurisdiction over cultivated meat, which makes it a little complicated. Now, now be, because of basically the historical jurisdictions of both the FDA and the USDA, up until the point of harvesting of those animal cells, everything is in the jurisdiction of the FDA, which kind of makes sense when you think about their areas of expertise because up until then, it is much more specific of um, kind of that biopharmaceutical um, production area in terms of the cell cultivation, cell banking, and then proliferation and differentiation. But once that harvesting takes place and um, you start working on the end product manufacturing, jurisdiction sw swaps over to the USDA in which they would be regulating um, and those, those final stages, stages basically in the same way that they would for any other traditional livestock. So, so we hope that, that cultivated meat is coming soon-ish to a store near you because, because it was just November of last year in which Upside got the first regulatory approval for their cultivated meat product. Now they will be waiting for that USDA grant of inspection. So to basically answer the question, why can't I eat it yet? Well, Regulation takes a long time in this country, but it's kind of the same in every country. So, correct. But that's not that's not everything. There are other policy considerations as well. One of which is just like, well, what the heck do we call this thing? If any of you got the first iteration of the flyer for this event, um, my talk wasn't originally called "Cultivated Meat." Now. Um, and and GFI, GFI, as an organization, does, does our best, best basically to align on everyone using cultivated meat as the preferred, preferred vocabulary. The, the FDA doesn't actually do that. They, they use the term cell cultured meat. Now, now when, when it comes to why do we choose a specific term, there, there are two primary goals. You want, you want it to be descriptive. So, so that the product, product isn't confusing, and you do want it to be appealing. Because, I mean, some of you may have heard about products like this as lab-grown meat. For a lot of people, it's like Frankenstein meat. No. It kind of means the same thing, but it's not accurate in terms of consumer perception. Now, cell cultured meat, actually, we have been, we have run um, consumer surveys about this. That's actually kind of confusing to a lot of people. When people hear cultured, they, they hear things like cultured yogurt or, you know, kimchi or just any other of the gut healthy stuff that isn't the same product. That's not the same kind of thing. So the reason why... Um, Cultivated meat is the preferred term is because it is the most descriptive as well as appealing. Because if you think about it, the process of cultivated meat production is pretty much the same as plant cultivation. Those really run in parallel tracks. You take a cutting, you take a cell sample, and then you proliferate it, whether that be growing or in that bioreactor, then you have um, more of that product. And um, so, so like there, there are there are different modifiers that like, like why not say cell cultivated meat or cell based meat? meat. Well, like, like all meat, meat is based on cells, and so that doesn't really make much sense. sense. And cell cultivated meat, again, based on the consumer survey, it didn't help with any additional understanding for consumers. And so that's just like basically an unnecessary addition.
in, in terms, terms of actually informing people. But, but then, then we get to the regulations about what alternative proteins can be called. And we can use examples of um, alternative milks as kind of what to expect, because this has been happening now for years, unfortunately. And yes, it is true that regulation, including label regulation, exists to protect the consumer. And that frankly has led to some bad faith arguments in terms of what alternative proteins, alternative milks can or should be called. There have been multiple lawsuits saying that because almonds don't lactate, you cannot call them milks. They need to be almond beverages. They need to be soy-based drinks. And I don't know about you, and this is not just a value judgment. We have done consumer research. But people, like reading the term almond milk, that does not make me think, oh, that probably came from a cow that's name was almond, or that like we have almond essence in a lactating cow. Like, again, kind of a bad faith argument. These are typically lawsuits that have either been directly, um, directly filed or supported by um, different industries, like the dairy industry, of course. And these labeling cases continue to come up. Whether it be with plant-based milks or plant-based meats, um, whether they are able to use meat-based terms like sausage or burger, as opposed to, and I guess this was actually proposed, plant-based disc. Which, <laughs> and so this is part of um, GOI's policy work, is making sure that the labeling is fair, so that yes, it is descriptive, people are not confused, but if you hear you know, plant-based burger, veggie burger. I don't think anyone sees the words veggie burger and expects it to be coming from a cow. And so that's what we are advocating for in part. But of course, there are more considerations for the policy side as well, which I would love to be getting into more with you um, in the future. All of this does beg the question of like, what do we do? I would love that everyone, you know, takes this as marching orders and comes into the um, alternative protein industry, whether it be through policy or otherwise. But the exciting thing, as I talked about before, is that we basically have space for everybody with any kind of expertise and any kind of driving motivation in alternative proteins. Even if we just look at cultivated meat and the research priorities, well, we need um, those high volume bioreactors. We need much more research and development into the scaffolding that takes those cells and turns it into a product that can replicate things like a steak, things like a chicken cutlet, and cell culture media optimization and recycling so that we can improve efficiency even more, both in terms of the environmental impact and in terms of the cost to consumer. And if it looks like I put pretty much every scientific um, discipline on here, that's kind of because that's what we did. We need people from every discipline to improve the affordability, accessibility, and quality of these products. But it's not just science. So, you know, the, the point of this whole symposium here, the, the policy behind it, yeah. We do need substantially more work in government to drive research into these necessary fields, to um, which, which of course includes funding and also those regulatory pathways, whether that be for labeling or approval for sale. And here's where um, I am speaking specifically to the students and the early career folks in the audience because I am still at the very beginning of my career within the alternative protein space. I joined GFI in December of last year. So I'm still pretty new to the field. And I frankly wasn't drawn specifically to alternative proteins. Here's like the dirty little secret of my career trajectory. I was looking for a way to transition my career into in, uh, something that's directly contributing to environmental sustainability. And I found GFI looking into the science behind their claims, I was completely sold. But that's the exciting thing about alt proteins, 
is that it is so inherently interdisciplinary that basically whatever your why is, whether it be environmental justice, whether it be animal rights, whether it be um, biosecurity, like I said, alternative proteins helps with that. And whatever your skills are, whether you are a biologist, a physicist, uh, um, an engineer, there is space for you in the alternative protein field. And that allows you to make an incredibly diverse impact in basically whatever field of the sector you are looking for. And we firmly believe at GFI that the universities are the starting place and that cornerstone of the alternative protein industry. And yes, specifically for Penn State. I talked about before um, the fact that we have actually one of our GFI grantees on the faculty here, which is incredibly exciting. And I kept on like looking for different reasons and different centers that were relevant to alternative proteins. And frankly, like I kept finding more. And so I stopped looking because Penn State is somewhere, you know, this is this is one of those hard things, um, as was talked about previously, that what universities love doing is cranking out PhDs. And a lot of times the same kind of PhDs. We don't just need those engineers. We don't just need those PhD level biologists. We do need people at the associates level, but we also need especially expertise in crop development, in agricultural sciences, in food sciences. And unfortunately, as is so often the case in this country, things like um, cultivated meat currently are focused on the coasts. There's a lot of companies in Silicon Valley because it is it's buzzy, it's techy, and in the middle of the country, still, um, is, we, we need that build up of workforce and expertise because that's where that's where the agricultural science happens. As a land grant university, places like Penn State are exactly where we are looking for building out that capacity. And that brings me to my pride and joy, and here I'm going to brag about it a little bit, the Alt Protein Project. So this is specifically what I work in as, my, as the academic community manager. And our goal with the All Protein Project is to build out this workforce. Because um, alternative proteins are currently less than 1% of the market. I believe it is still less than half of a percent of the overall protein market. And it's already when we are interacting with the companies that work with us, they say one of their biggest bottlenecks is lack of talent. So the sector is so small and they still don't have enough people to fill the roles that they are looking for. If we're going to expand, we need to train people. And what the All Protein Project does is it empowers students, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, to help their universities become those hubs of alternative protein development with um, each one of these objectives being equally as important, including education. Because even in the food science departments of many universities, there are no, uh, there tends to be no dedicated alternative protein courses. If there is one, um, often it is one module or one introductory course and um, very little overall education development. We have had a lot of success of our existing student groups helping design and lead alternative protein courses to start with um, that development. We also have goals with research to help directly drive funding through GFI or other granting bodies to drive that, um, that research specific to alternative proteins and innovation for that uh, technology transfer. And of course, just overall awareness and community building. I live um, in North Carolina, where the vast majority of my neighbors have no idea what the heck I'm talking about when I say that I work in alternative proteins. It's one of those things that, like, if you know, you know, and if you don't, it doesn't make any sense because it's just not really a part of a large piece of the conversation. And so, yes, community building and awareness is a key part of what our student leaders do. And this is one of the favorite images of my life right now. This is our current community of students, um, of student groups. Right now we have 30 active chapters literally around the world um, who are making this change. And I do want to say, 
applications for our next cohort is open. I currently don't have an application from Penn State. Not saying that I would be too insulted if one didn't come in, but come on. I do want to point out, like, it's not just for funsies. We do have our students really making significant change in the space. Like I talked about, um, there are purely um, student championed courses that would not have existed were it not for our, our alt protein leaders. Um, our groups also interface directly with some of the leaders in the field both for networking and career building. We have had success with students spinning out um, alt protein companies and landing um, research grants either independently as graduate students or in collaboration with their, um, their PI in general. So please, again, and I will be sharing these slides, so the link will be available to you. Um, and I am the one who is actually going to be um, evaluating all of the applications, so you can ask me for like hidden insights and all of that, if you would like. We do also have in a bunch of information on the website and recordings as well. But I do want to just end by coming back to this. Like I said at the beginning, food is tech. Tech changes. If you are roughly my age, you will know that as a kid, like you would go to the grocery store and it would look really different. You, you wouldn't even be able to find an avocado. Like, like that, that is something that has really changed within my lifetime of the American diet, including avocados. Is, is that tech? Not, not really. It's a demonstration of the change in food culture. Oh, there we go. The, the same is true with tofu. I couldn't find that until about 10, 15 years ago in the grocery store. And only now is this becoming a little more typical of a, an American food. And even the same with quinoa. Like, like these, these are, are vegetarian, vegetarian options that just, just didn't exist in the American diet, um, frankly, frankly, a couple of years ago. And, and as, as I said at the beginning, beginning yes, cultivated meat is a different, different technology, technology, but it's not inherently different in type. It is all a part of the change in our food systems and our food culture that will be necessary in order to create that transition to that sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. As I said, I'm going to continue plugging our website because there is just a plethora of resources, whether you're interested in the science, the industry, or the policy, and I encourage everybody to dig into that. I would be happy to talk to you about specific pieces of information if you have specific interests. But with that, I do want to thank you for your time. And remember, I will be around for the next couple of days and would encourage any questions either right now or during happy hour. So thank you, everybody, for your time. Yeah, I think we have time for a couple quick questions. Yes. Uh, so at the beginning, you mentioned about how the projected demand for like meat and dairy products is rising over the next uh, like three hundred years. Um, I know, like from my previous research, that a lot of that is focused in developing countries moving to developed countries. Um, like, what's the kind of reality of the situation in allowing or like having cultivated meats be an accessible option for those types of countries, or is it something that's like only feasible for these already developed countries. Yes, thank you. For those of you who might not have heard the question, um, please correct me if I am mistaken, was effectively increasing meat demand is largely driven from developing countries. As the overall um, GDP increases, especially per capita, there tends to be a transition to increased meat consumption. And with this, I do view it as um, kind of a, a parallel trajectory to renewable energy in general, because the argument is always, well, basically like if the US was able to burn their way to prosperity,